Good to be uh, talking to you all, and um, it, it's uh, uh, just so great to sort of be continuing to see this study just yielding and yielding our in international youth development study. Uh, my name is John Toombrew. I'm um, from the uh, Centre for Social and Early Emotional Development called SEED at Deakin University in Australia. And uh, so I'm going to be talking to you today from a more sort of general view of uh, what we're learning about how to do these types of cross-national studies. So the first thing to say is you saw from the data that was presented just uh, that we seem to be able to tease out some um, differences in our uh, two states, so comparing Washington State with Victoria, that are quite important in terms of understanding things that uh, have intervention implications. So I guess as prevention scientists, we have to decide, are we there to um, just model data, or is our job also to try to use this data to change uh, and improve the public health? And I think that the position we've taken is where we can see an opportunity to actually take the next steps that we are very keen to do so. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the data in Australia has also been used to try to encourage uh, a shift in the dial. So first I want to acknowledge a number of other uh, co-authors that are going to be um, working on this literature review. This is going to be, um, in the end, a published literature review. And I'm a call out now, for if you know of papers that could be relevant, I'll show you what we're trying to do. And uh, please let us know. We're, um, we're very keen on sort of making it fairly comprehensive. Uh, so, and then I want to start off by a success story. So I'm now moving um, to, uh, uh, this is a, a graph I'm very proud of. This is the, uh, when we first started doing the um, International Youth Development Study in 2002, uh, as we saw from the figures that have been presented today, we're really in the embarrassing position as a nation of having possibly some of the highest rates of um, youth alcohol use in the world in the school age population. That had arisen because of a mistaken belief in our country that uh, if it was, um, if we used a sort of educational approach to drinking, that children would have different impacts to those in America where everybody's um, very tough on alcohol and, and, and that would be causing children to go underground and use all sorts of other things. So there's all these theories that led to the view that we can train young people not to have problems with alcohol. But we, we saw that it didn't seem to work. Our harm reduction approach actually was a, a situation where we were having a lot of problems with alcohol. And actually, as we see now, that that has not diminished. We've still got problems, a generation uh, that, are, that are in the um, child rearing age with very high rates of alcohol and a misunderstanding of the harms. But this is, you can see that this graph is actually coming down. It hasn't come down accidentally. Um, but the, this is from 41,000 surveys we've done where we've actually got, this, this is from work we've done with the Communities That Care Youth Survey. Again, the, um, the data you see from the International Youth Development Study is actually a longitudinal study of the Communities That Care Youth Survey. And so here we can actually use the same items to look at what's happening over time. So why did this reduction in Australia occur? We're actually now um, got down to rates. We started off at rates, as I said, some of the highest in the world. We're not down to below the US. We're still above the US in that same year of 2015. But we are lower than um, many places now in Europe. We weren't before and in the UK. So things are, you know, reducing. Not accidentally, I, I'm going to argue. Um, and uh, the, um, <clears throat> the other thing to say about this data is that they're modelled, um, they're, they're almost identical to two other surveys that are done in Australia. Um, one of them is that we have a national school survey, and that's showing exactly the same trend. And we also have a household, national household survey, and uh, there's a group of young people that are questioned in that one, and again, the same trend occurs. So we're all in screaming agreement that this is actually reduction. There isn't an increase in illicit drugs that goes behind this, and tobacco use is also coming down. So we have been asking ourselves the question, why has this happened? And I'm, uh, the, the, uh, and what are the sort of risk factors that predicted the change? And we're able, because we have the Communities of Care Youth Survey, to actually interrogate this question in a great deal of depth. And what we discovered when we ran an analysis looking at our trends and we used a procedure called um, elasticity modelling that comes from economic partners, we can actually look at um, 
uh, what might have, if you bundle the effects in the communities that we're studying, because we, we have epidemiologically valid samples in 109 communities across that time, we can actually understand what sort of trends and, uh, are explaining the reduction in alcohol. And we end up with um, lower community availability, uh, which is a risk factor that's measured consistently over those 15-year uh, trend, and um, also less favourable parent attitudes, particularly these two things are related to lower underage alcohol sales occurring in Australia and fewer parents supplying alcohol to adolescents. So I'm going to come back to the cross-national study and how we use that data to actually try and encourage policy change quite deliberately in these areas. But firstly I want to say, some people say, oh, I know this is a trend that's occurred in Europe and other places, but these are figures that um, where we present Australian data from the National School Survey with the SBAD survey in Europe. And you can see there, in 2011, we were starting to come down in Australia on alcohol. Europe, the UK, were not. We're still higher than the US by 2011. For cigarettes, we're actually getting to the point where we're similar to the US by that year, and for illicit drugs, lower. And uh, so, you know, this is an, um, so that's just to sort of show that these cross-national comparisons comparisons are actually quite important and not every nation shows the same trend. Some people say the reduction in alcohol, it is, a, it is a national, international trend now, but it happened in different nations at different time points with the US um, policies in, uh, getting that to occur in the 80s due to deliberate policies that we now know are effective. So you can read that paper and I, um, I like to get more citations, so please have a look and cite, cite that paper um, where we're actually now, why did we address those risk factors? Well, take a bow. There's uh, Barb McMorris in the audience. I'm going to refer to your paper, Barb, because it was quite similar in our thinking. We, and this, uh, the actual published paper came after years of looking at the data that we had. Uh, we were actually looking at this issue of... Uh, so Barb's paper is a, a really good example of, where, of what I want to talk about today. It's cross-national research that has actually tried to deal with a particular parameter within the developmental um, a, a sets of complexity and actually try to sort of put the microscope just on that one factor and then just as we've seen in today's presentations, what Barb was doing in that paper was trying to sort of think, well, what's the best way to analyse this data so that we can actually shed light on the issue of whether or not the, the parents supervised drinking that was occurring in Australia that we thought was actually the way to manage alcohol. Was it going to be a different effect in Australia where it was quite normative to the US where it wasn't normative? So the method of analysis that Barb used here was um, obviously looking at latent Anal latent variable analysis, but using path analysis and uh, controlling using the, the method that is quite common of looking at constrained and unconstrained models. But through that, she was able to actually come to a, quite a confident con conclusion, which is similar to what we've heard today from Sabrina, is that sometimes risk factors can be quite prevalent in your country, so a very high level of the risk factor, but the developmental effect is exactly the same. So it doesn't take much to think that through. And if we think of the etiological fraction, the idea then is what you've actually got is you can have a risk factor then that's actually doing a whole lot of harm in developmentally. Um, and it, it, it's, and the, the solution is to reduce the level of that risk factor. So here's the, um, you probably can't see this, but uh, you can go and have a look at that paper and you can see that what we're, how that's been presented is there's the, um, you can see that there's the, the Australian uh, coefficient and the US coefficient next to each other, and then Barb went beyond that to actually sort of test again to see if these were different. So the thing about this type of modelling is it does give us the potential to actually start to think about how should we do this type of analysis. So one of the points I want to make today is that a lot of uh, very important, if we think of um, the idea of what are the important developmental effects that we really need to understand? And one of, some of those effects are not really amenable to RCTs. So we need to find a consensus in the prevention science community about what sort of methods can we use then to tease out some of these risk factors that actually have very large aggregate effects on populations. So things that uh, we're measuring here between two different states 
um, looking at things like parents' behaviour, a particular parameter of supplying alcohol to children, is actually something that's uh, going to be hard to understand except where you start to model it from a, a very strong theoretical lens as we see here. So now, the, the, now we start to talk about the purpose of our literature review is what we're trying to do is capture papers that have actually used longitudinal data to try to shed light, uh, light on a, per a developmental parameter that is thought to be influencing um, alcohol-related harms. So that's what I'm interested in. So if you feel that you know of a cross-national study that's compared states or nations and uh, that has data of this type, we, we want to hear about that because we're trying to do a fairly comprehensive look at how these analyses are done. I'm going to talk to you about some of the early, um, early, early things that we're getting from, from this work. But uh, Barb's paper is a very good example of, a, of our team struggling with it. We probably... Um, we do have others who are very enthusiastic about various levels of, um, of uh, cross-nation invariance testing, and again, uh, that can, uh, there's various ways that you can do that. Again, when uh, Rico presented, he said that we started off by trying to make sure that when we were looking at an item in our study, that it was the semantic equivalent in the two nations. So we at least know that, that the children, when they were reading the item, they didn't have a different construct in mind. But we also know that the way the items group together, which is the beginning of um, thinking of their uh, reliability or their um, inter-item associations, are very similar patterns in the two nations. Again, su uh, suggesting that the way that young people are thinking about these things is actually very similar, confirming that. So this type of um, the development, cross-national developmental comparisons is where we're looking at being able to shed in light onto national policy or cultural parameters such as Barb's look at the family or uh, community norms, other issues that are actually very important in the picture of the things that we sometimes have to neglect because they're too complicated or hard to look at. But they, they impact large populations and they contribute to international variation that's quite fascinating when we begin to shed our lens on the world, um, they're very important for youth alcohol outcomes. Now this is um, a very uh, international thing to say, but we're very excited about looking now at different nations and uh, I was um, last year in Spain and I was saying to them, tell me about some of the things you're excited about in your nation, so tell me the things that you think are really having a good effect. And they said, oh, we love the way we do the family things, you know, we're very collective and even now we, t we ring our parents a lot and we talk and we think that we, can d we have a lot of other things that we might not have exactly right in prevention, but we'd love to have more work done to sort of show does the Spanish collectivist way of doing business there, is that actually helping us? And so we've agreed when we do, you know, we will do cross-nation work and we're interested to compare development in Spain. I said, I want a set of items to try and measure that protective effect because that's the sort of magic you can do with cross-national research. So it's getting more interested in going deeper into these aspects of culture that could actually be important for informing the next phase of um, our work. So some of these, they offer a way of evaluation um, studies. They offer an evaluation design. So here we see with what Sabrina's telling us, there's a potential that we may be able to evaluate aspects of policy or begin to see which parts of them in the workplace might be uh, important. So eventually when we're clear about those, maybe there is randomised trials that can come from that. But also um, we're looking for studies that have some level of matching. And uh, so as Rico said, we did quite a job here of matching our designs but um, also so that it can be uh, analysed so they can assess the effects of developmentally re relevant cultural parameters. And then also the part that Barb did was a method, statistically, some other way of cross-nationally comparing these effects. So actually, th these are the sort of things we're interested in studying. So here's an example of a review you can do. You can do this fairly simply in PubMed, just a first search. You know, I repeated it um, before the conference. And you, if you use these parameters, you know, you end up with 34 documents, you look at them and you realise that you need to actually do the search other ways because it's just not an easy search to do just very simply. But you do begin to get at things using these types of methods. And we've been looking at this for some time and uh, we've had, um, had a chance to bring up a few studies which we're going to talk about just briefly. 
So here's one that is looking at alcohol marketing in Europe, and uh, our European colleagues might know some of these authors. Uh, they might even be in the room, some of these people, but they're doing the European long longitudinal study looking at the relationship between adolescent alcohol marketing exposure and alcohol use. Here they've comp compared Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland. Uh, so have, we, this will be one of the papers that definitely goes in the review. But again, it would be good to um, see this type of data sort of maximised. So a comment, I, I, I don't want to be critical, but what I'm going to say here is that the way they've looked at their developmental parameters, in some ways I don't think they've maximised the ability to look at the cross-national comparison. So here we have a graphing uh, procedure, but not a statistical test. And th at this stage, there hasn't been the interest that Bob showed in the invariance uh, possibility that the, um, the way that the items sort of group together. But all that could be done, and because this is really rich data, that you might actually get more interested in, well, which nations are actually perhaps um, have different policies around alcohol marketing. One thing we would agree is that it's a very important question. And having set up the study and collected the data, it's actually possible to do sort of really make some great insights if you can actually dig deeper in the, in the analysis. What we think is that it's particularly valuable to do this type of analysis where you have a developmental theory that lies behind. So we saw that with what Sabrina was doing, that she's, what she's doing is she's laying out a developmental theory and then testing that. And that we think is, we, we will begin to try and argue here that you know, it's time for us to set some good practice around these things. Here is another study that's being done by a consortium that I'm, I'm involved with, and we have a number of Australian longitudinal studies, not the IOADS at this stage, coming in here to the Cannabis Cohort Research Consortium, and so producing papers. This is not on cannabis. The actual paper is looking at um, different patterns of alcohol use in adolescents and how they rate to relate to patterns of young adult alcohol-related harm. And uh, now, this study is um, comparing different states in Australia, uh, but it also compares Australia and New Zealand. So this will get into our, um, into our study. And um, here what was used were regression predictors that cross -nat were, where the, um, the actual slopes were cross-nationally compared using world statistics that were adjusted using propensity uh, analyses. So again, that's a, that's a good, that's a, it's good to see that here's, a, here's again an effort to test these things statistically and we will want to invite, you know, critique, was this a better method? Should, uh, um, was Barb's a better method? You know, so we want to sort of look at the, the pros and cons. So I'm trying to get people interested in having the conversation around this. But uh, what is interesting is that again what we start to see here is that um, this, this study shed light on the importance of the frequency of drinking. So there's been a lot of work to look at the amount you drink in adolescence. And Australian guidelines um, have now sort of moved, partly because of our advocacy, to an abstinence approach in the school age period. But a lot of pe people were still focused on the amount you drank. But this is really saying it's actually how frequently you drink. Abstinence is a very good thing for protecting you, but how frequently you drink predicts a whole range of harms. And very little evidence of any cross-state or cross-national differences, it, testing it quite carefully, the models end up being the same. So um, again, an interesting result. Am I going too long? I possibly am. You're starting to look at me bad. Yeah. All right, so reflections, last slide. Um, there are. As you saw, a lot of the studies that I'm presenting are fairly recent, so this is something that seems to be coming. It's, a, it's an area that I think will, first prediction is I actually think that there's going to be um, a lot to gain by maximising this type of design. So these cross-national comparisons that use longitudinal data and actually uh, try and model these um, state differences on important parameters. I, I, I'm very excited by them, and I think Rico has said to me at different times, we both felt it was a turning point. You really can learn some things here. I still think that we're, we're babes in the woods in terms of the potential of this data. I think that it's got a lot of chance for us to actually um, make a lot of progress about things that are universals in prevention science and those things that are actually culturally specific. So I think those, those are really good things for us to untangle in prevention science. Here we have the, um, the, the potential to test these effects that vary cross-nationally, again, and uh, I think that's going to re really lead to an exciting... Uh, the need for us to collaborate in the international development sciences is 
uh, here written large. I think we've got to start to talk about forming consortia. Let's get busy in this area. The range of methods are interesting at this stage uh, to compare parameters and uh, to control for the cross-national invariance in the confounders, so, but it, we don't have a consensus on it. And I think we, a, a paper could actually help us to, at this stage, set some um, event, uh, conventions and collaborations that will standardise designs, methods, analytic techniques, and that through that we'll have some important advances for prevention science. So really that's what the paper will try to do. So this is a call out. Let me know if you've got something that we should be looking at. And, uh, and I guess that's, that's what we want to say for now. So thank you.